When the digging ended, the total was 27 murdered. William Reese is the only suspect in the murders of Jessica Kane, Laura Smither, Kellyanne Cox, and Tiffany Johnston. They got me set up like I'm a serial killer right now. Tata is charged with four counts of manslaughter for this February 24th fire that killed four children. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Evidence Room. This week we're looking at the case of serial killer Dean Coral, who was nicknamed the Candyman. If you'll recall, in the first season of the Evidence Room, there was another killer nicknamed the Candyman. Houston, sadly, has had two killers with that nickname. The unbelievable story began on August 7, 1973. 33-year-old Dean Coral is shot to death at a house in Pasadena. A 17-year-old boy, Elmer Wayne Henley, calls police to tell them of the shooting and says he did it. His story did not end there. Henley begins to unravel a tale of homosexual torture and murder. Officers begin investigating a case that would soon shock the city and the country. Joining me today, we have veteran KPRC2 journalist Phil Archer and director of victim services for Houston Crime Stoppers, Andy Kahn. And we're diving in today with one of the most prolific serial killers in U.S. history, and that's Dean Coral. You gentlemen are very familiar with Dean Coral and his two accomplices. How many victims did Dean Coral have officially and even unofficially? That they know of, 28. But it's widely suspected there are many more that unfortunately will never be found. He, the ma Houston mass murders, and that's what that case came to be called, without a doubt, the most horrific murder case in the history of Houston. 28 young men and boys, the oldest was 20, the youngest was 13, most were somewhere in the middle, were abducted, tortured, raped, and murdered in a three-year span uh, between 70 and 1973. And the only reason they got caught was because of a falling out uh, between Coral and his accomplices, Elmer Wayne Henley, and well, David Brooks actually was involved in that, but Brooks was still acting with him then. Right, so let's talk about though, he lured all these young men and it was through his connection to his parents' candy company. In fact, we've talked about this a couple of times, he had the nickname the Candyman. Houston's had two killers named well, the Candyman, but he had the Candyman and the Pied Piper, right? Because of the way he got his victims. Actually, that's where Henley and Brooks came in. He recruited them to go out and find uh, these boys, uh, many of them were friends of Henley and Brooks, and bring them to the house, his house, and he, several houses where he lived in, that, in those years. And this is in the Heights area, right? Well, some of them, uh, probably the majority. Uh, but he also lived up off Westcott near Memorial. He lived in Pasadena. That's where it finally ended mm -hmm. in Pasadena. He, he moved around a lot. And he, he paid Brooks and Henley $200 a head to bring him boys. And then once he got them to the house, he'd, he'd get them drunk, they'd party. That was, the, that was the come on, come over to the house and we'll have a party. And so he'd give them marijuana, other drugs and, and alcohol and wait for them to pass out. And when they woke up, they would be tied up, gagged, uh, very often tied to a torture board. Right. And and then they were done. It was this huge wooden table that he had yeah. made just for this purpose, yeah. correct? Yeah. How did he recruit? I mean, I, I, here's the thing. So we had two accomplices. I know you had David Brooks and, and Elmer Wayne oh, Henley. Yep. And I know you got to know both of their cases very well, but how do you recruit somebody? Hey, help me lure, kidnap, torture, and kill people. How does that, how does, how does that happen? I mean, was he that charismatic, Dean Coral? Obviously, in that era, everything was different. First, let's go back to yeah. what, how they were char characterized. And I noticed, Robert, you called them Houston serial killers. Mm -hmm. And Phil, you correctly coined them the mass murders because that's how they were characterized. They were called the mass murders because keep in mind, the, co the term serial killer wasn't even coined by then. Right. There was no such thing. 
as a serial killer, which is why they're actually incorrectly defined as the mass murderers. Okay. But by definition now, right. they're considered classified as serial killers. So Henley and Brooks, you know, you know, back in that era, you had pe you know, people that were basically on their own in, in a lot of cases, you know, and some might say came from broken homes or whatever. So Henley and Brooks, for whatever reasons, found Dean Coral. Dean Coral found two willing individuals who had no issues about paying them to get young boys of the same age back to his house and like Phil said, to party, and then would of course later eventually kill, rape, and torture them. So the way I always described it is Henley, it was mostly Henley, but Henley basically marched these young boys you know, procured, procured them, marched them to the house, knowing full well they would never leave again. Yeah, and what's interesting about that, Brooks recruited Henley. Henley met Dean Coral with Coral, uh, or with Brooks bringing him over there to be a victim. That's why he brought him over there. But, but he changed for, his mind. For some reason he changed his mind, and that's never really been explained. I, I don't remember anything from the time, and I haven't found anything in research. To explain why he did that. But let's go back. At that point in Houston, all these young boys, I mean, all these young boys and young men, you said probably came from broken homes. So I'm, I'm assuming it's not like now where it's there like, wow, we had a lot came, of people yeah. disappearing. No. What's going on? Any of that in Houston at the time? What I think is interesting, and there was a, a, a large outcry about it after all of this was discovered. It, it is very interesting that this was able to go on for three years. And what, what happened, unfortunately, in a lot of these cases, parents would become concerned, they would report to the police, and the police would kind of mark it off as a runaway. Uh, and there are lots, again, as you know, there are lots of runaways. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and HPD, H HPD came under no small amount of criticism as a result of that. When this all came to light. Yeah. Okay. And they, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but they kind of, not kind of, but correct me if I'm wrong, they buried bodies all over the place. I mean, all the way to High Island and Bolivar Peninsula, right? High, High Island, uh, some in outside or at Lake Sam Houston, probably the majority in the boat shed over in Southwest Houston. Okay, all right. And so let's talk about, let's talk about coral. Coral actually came from a family of means, right? Yeah. They, had, they had the Coral can Candy Company yeah. in the Heights area, I right. believe. Always had plenty of money. He was a military for... veteran, too, if I'm, if I'm correct. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he came yeah. out of the military. Okay, and did he use the Candy Company as somewhat of a entree to lure younger people no. to him? Well, my, uh, my remembrance of all this was not so much. He had a lot of money mm -hmm. from the family business. So he could use that. And these, these kids are from a, by and large, working class families. Okay. A lot of them, Henley's family, for mm -hmm. instance, very poor, had no money. I, it's, I think Henley claimed that one of the reasons he at first didn't buy in to the offer to go get some boys and bring them to him. Okay. But later, within a year, he did because his family was having financial difficulties. So Carl had flashy cars. As a matter of fact, he brought, bought David Brooks a Corvette, a new Corvette, as a wow. sort of reward for helping him out. He had a lot of money to flash around, and he always had a supply of drugs and alcohol and a, he had a place to just go wild, you know? Just, no, and they weren't good, you know, and Dean Coral couldn't go out himself and bring young boys and teenagers yeah. in, and that's why he needed, you know, his foot soldiers out there. And he found two willing individuals. So he would just it. wait for Henley and Brooks to go out and bring young yeah, men. Yeah, Coral never back. brought anybody over himself. Yeah. Did this all happen in one place? All the murders, I mean. No. No, it, like Phil said, it, it, was, it happened all over the place, but there were certain places, obviously, it was predominant mm -hmm. in as well. You know, keep in mind that that time era, 70 through 73, when you had missing boys, you didn't have communications between families. Mm -hmm. So one family had no idea that another family had a missing son. There were no groups like Texas Equisearch, you know, going out there and looking. Right, there's no for, social there media, nothing. there's no message there was boards. Nothing. Yeah, yeah. There was no communication. So nobody either added it up or nobody said, hey, this family down the street also has 
another missing boy yeah. and so forth. So you didn't have all these families who were basically coming in force demanding answers. It was one after another, and they were able to get away with this, you know, poo-poo answer that, you know, there were runaways and they'll come back. And also, if I recall, some of them, I think, actually Henley penned notes, penned notes to the families yes. saying that they, they had taken off and that they would be in touch. So Henley kind of led these families on that their, you know, their son was OK. He just left town for work. Yeah, because really? a, a lot of these got a lot of these victims yeah. were his buddies, friends. At, at least so there'd be some so there'd yeah. be like some connection there that he was trying to misdirect from. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about what finally brought this to an end. It was pretty it was pretty <laughs> gruesome. Uh you know, I mean, a lot of people want to say that Elmer Wayne Henley himself is a victim. Because mm -hmm. again, keep in mind that Henley had brought over several people. Mm -hmm. And Henley did a no-no, according to Dean Corll. He actually brought a girl over. I mean, her name was Rhonda Williams. Mm -hmm. Henley brings a girl, and you don't bring girls over. That was not Corll's M.O. And he was very upset. And at that time, he was going to not only just kill the girl and her friend, he was also going to take Henley out as well. Okay. And so things really went awry in that house. I mean, I think Henley at one time found himself tied up and yeah. then he managed to get out of the grip. And when he Carl, talked his way out, that's true. And when Carl oh, was did, going, yeah. yeah. Okay. He basically, so bagged. he was going to kill. So Coral was going to kill Henley yeah. for bringing the girl yeah. over and kind of ruining the atmosphere, so to speak. Yeah. Wow. They, they, uh, it was typical MO. Uh, they all had marijuana and beer and everybody passed out. And when Henley woke up, he was tied up and Coral was putting a gag in his mouth. So I'm assuming Coral stayed at least somewhat sober. I mean, that, that's how everybody else was able to pass out and he was able to get the better of them. That's my assumption. But yeah, he didn't. But it never really I, was I specific. I can't imagine okay. he partook. Yeah, no, right. I can't see. So yeah. Henley brings this girl over. Henley wakes up tied up. Coral's angry with him. Henley somehow talks his way out of it. What happens after that? He also wanted, I believe, Henley and the other guy to rape the girl. Yeah, that he came over so okay. that he yeah. could watch as well. Okay, and that's where things really started getting she, way out of. She, I think, raised the flag because he told Henley to to rape her, and Henley and gave him a knife. Said, "Cut her clothes off." And he's cutting her clothes off, and I'm not. I don't. I don't have the exact quote, but she said, "Is this for real?" And he said, "Oh yeah," and she said, "Maybe this isn't exact quote." Said. Are you going to let this happen? And something snapped in Henley at that point, and he backed off. And he got Curl's 22 caliber pistol and pointed it at him and said, Dean, it's going too far. We can't do this. Curl said, well, go ahead and shoot me. And basically, the question is manhood says, you haven't got the guts to do it. Uh, and Henley hesitated. My understanding from the record is that he hesitated, but then Coral tried to rush him and he shot him and hit him in the head, right square in the forehead, but it didn't penetrate his skull. That's not uncommon. Because it was a 22, a little 22. 22. Yeah. yeah, that goes around the side of the skull. Mm -hmm. And so Coral kept coming. Well, Henley shot again and shot him in the arm. Coral turns around to leave. Henley followed him and pumped three into his back and that killed him. Mama. Who's this? It's Wayne. Yes, this is Mama, baby. Mama? Yeah. I killed Dean. Wayne? Ma'am? Oh, Wayne, you did him? Yeah, yes, sir. Oh, God. Where are you? I'm, it's all right. Wayne? It's all right. It's all right. Where are you? Well, I'm out of his warehouse. Where? Out of that warehouse he keeps. Can I come out there? Yeah, yes, yes. No. Is that my own Clark? She can't, no, you can't come. I'm, I'm with the police, mama. 
Henley told police he killed 33-year-old Dean Allen Coral during a party at Coral's house. Henley said Coral had threatened him with a pistol and a knife, at trying to force him into sexual acts. Henley said Coral bragged about the other murders. Henley led officers to a boat shed in Houston near Hiram Clark in South Maine. The digging begins, and beneath the dirt floor of the shed, officers find that Henley's tale is true. First, two bodies are uncovered, then five, and before the night is over, seven. The next day, more digging and more bodies. When it is all over, 17 are uncovered here. Henley says there are more. He takes officers to the piney woods of East Texas near Lake Sam Rayburn, and four more bodies are found. The search for victims goes on to the beach at High Island, and more bodies are discovered there. When the digging ended, the total was 27 murdered, the largest mass murder case in our country's history. Once that ended, that was really only the beginning of Houston learning about exactly what Dean Coral, David Brooks, and Elmer Wayne Henley had been doing. We're going to talk more about that coming up after the break. I don't think we have more than one in this hole, I see. But is there any doubt that this is a body? No doubt. There's a skull and a jawbone and everything. Not any doubt at all. Welcome back to the evidence room. We're talking about serial killer Dean Coral and his accomplices, Elmer Wayne Henley and David Brooks. So when did police start figuring out that, oh God, this is, well, this is incredible. I mean, the amount of, 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 of death that these three have, have Henley gave him Brooks. created. And together, they got Brooks immediately, and together they set them down and interrogated them. And then it began to come out, it began to come out, and uh, they, began to find, they began to find out the locations where the bodies are. No, at first, uh, we didn't put a lot of faith in what he had to say until we got to the boat shed and opened it up and uh, saw some bags of lime and uh, smelled the odor of decaying flesh inside. And uh, at that time, we knew that uh, possibly he was telling the truth. It's interesting. That night, um, they start gearing up, and they're keeping this very hush-hush, except in the case of Jack Cato. Well, I was going to say, and that's I was going to stop you there, because I remember, and this is way before my time, right. but there's that, that famous mm -hmm. clip, and they certainly don't let reporters get this close anymore but i mean we had you know jack cato who's another veteran who's since passed away but a veteran well-known well, journalist with with kprc too former, former county treasurer but probably he was like he was literally like right next to the officers as they were digging up the the bodies well, i was even stunning. more even more intimate than yeah. that he uh jack was in my opinion the best connected police reporter that ever mm -hmm. worked mm -hmm. in houston and probably any other city as well uh he knew all the police officers in all the departments in this area. And they called Jack. They didn't talk to anybody else in the media. They kept it very hush hush and they called Jack and told him what they had what he, he told him what they had. And he came over to the house and then they all headed over to the boat shed where the majority of the uh, bodies were buried. And Cato broke that story. It became an international story. Cato broke that story. Because he had he had was leaning in the, over the police car. Yeah. And I remember that epic quote that they had from Henley talking to his mother. Mama. Mama, I killed Dean. Yeah. Mama. Who's this? It's Wayne. Yes, this is Mama, baby. Mama. Yeah. I killed Dean. Wayne. Ma'am. What are you doing? Yeah. Yes. Oh, God. This is what, 1973? Is that yeah, correct? Yeah. Okay. So cell phones clearly were not a big thing, but, but Jack had like one of those bad it's phones. Like Wouldn't Jack's? No, it, was, it, was, it was installed in the car. All the police reporters at Channel 2, yeah. and Ray Miller, the news director, is very proud of this, all of them had radio phones. So what uh, it was was a patch. I mean, you pick it up, you call the operator, and she would patch you into a landline. And what happened was they had, Henley was cooperating with them. Mm -hmm. and they wanted to keep him cooperating with them, and he wanted to call his mother. Uh, and they, there was no phone there, so Jack volunteered. Said, "Well, I've got a phone in the car. Why don't you come over here?" Well, he didn't tell them that he also had a loudspeaker on that phone, and he punched the button, 
so that he could record everything that Henley and his mother said. And that's how we that's got Jack's Mom and I Jack. Dean. That was very Jack. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that was very Jack. Okay. Well, and, yeah. well I mean, it, it was revealed immediately. The police could have stopped it if they wanted to. They did. Okay. Yeah, it was, a, it was a different era. Can you imagine today walking up to a person who's just admitted to slaughtering dozens of people and go, here's my cell phone. You know, right. no, that would never happen well, today. So, okay, so he, he does that and they do that. And they start finding all these bodies. But it, it's my understanding... It's still a question, mean, even to this day, now in 2023, there's still a question mark as to whether they found all of the victims. I they're, think it's assumed they haven't, right? It's pretty much amongst those that are keep up with the serial killers right. and, and everything like that. It's assumed that there's still others out there. I mean, you had bodies that weren't identified for years, 30-some-odd yeah. years that bodies weren't identified. So would it surprise me? that there are others? No. The problem, of course, is where are they? And the only person right now that's still alive that would know that is Elmer Wayne Henley. Elmer Wayne Henley and David Brooks sit in the sun on a Gulf Coast beach near the small town of High Island, east of Houston. They have brought lawmen here to search for more bodies. In the Houston, the mass murderers, quote, serial killers, it was the largest in this country's history. It superseded, and as Phil mentioned earlier to me, there was a guy, a farm worker uh, out of California named Juan, Juan Corona, Corona, that had 25. So with the 28 known victims, this was the tops in this country's history, and it finally, you know, they lost their, quote, throne when John Wayne Gacy, you know, was discovered with 33 to 34 bodies later. You know, it's interesting that Gacy actually uh, learned from the press coverage of Coral's murder. Really? About, yeah, about recruiting and that sort of thing. He admitted that, that he watched it very closely and apparently picked up some pointers that he used to abduct, rape, and murder, what, 33, I think 33, it was? 33, which, That they know of. Still, just another reason I hate clowns. Um, <laughs> Um, same categories of yeah. victims, too, young boys and teenage boys. Exactly the same thing. Yeah. It's a sexual thing. Right. Oh, my goodness. Oh, you yeah. know, we, have, we have a lawyer in town who worked that case, who? Uh, Larry Finder. You know okay. Larry? No, I don't. Larry, at the time, was a young state's attorney in Illinois, and he was assigned to that case. And I, I've talked to him about it, and he's still deeply affected by it. Okay. He, he has a... Gacy drew a map right. of his basement floor showing where the bodies were buried. Okay. He's but got, that's Gacy. That's, that's, that's Gacy. Gacy. Okay, he, okay. He's got that map yeah. in his office. Anyway. Well, let's talk about let's, let's talk about the trials, because I am curious about the trial. So what came out during the trial? Because I've got to imagine the entire city is, is watching the TV, grabbing the newspaper almost every well, day you, that these guys you, are going to If you back up a little bit, yeah. yeah. Uh, Channel 2 broke into programming to announce this. The other two stations pretty closely followed that. Uh -huh. This, uh, it's hard... It's hard to explain the effect this had on the city. People, first of all, nobody in this country was used to this kind of crime. There, there'd been, a, there'd been some serial killings, uh, but Not this, of this, magnitude. this, yeah, yeah this was, was different. And the, and the motives, all of that, you know, it, 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 it was unimaginable. I mean, today it's unimaginable that somebody would do that. And Houston was just transfixed for weeks and months about this. It was constantly in the media. And so I'm guessing the reason these two didn't get capital murder is because they didn't kill more than one person in a single... I mean, even as horrific as it is, capital murder is a very it, specific... Believe it or not, yeah. the death penalty at that time was That's ruled right. unconstitutional that was during the by the U.S. Then. Supreme Court from 70 to 74. You didn't have death penalty right. cases eligible. So timing's everything. Ah. And the timing for this merited the fact that you couldn't charge him with capital murder. So they both got life sentences. Yeah, did they yeah. plead or, I mean, how did that... There was a change, there was also, correct me if I'm wrong, because of there was the a change publicity, of venue, yeah. right, you couldn't even try the case here right. in Houston. Henley's trial was moved out of Houston in an effort to escape the publicity. The case was taken to San Antonio. The prosecutor was Harris County District Attorney Carol Vance. The defense attorney, Will Gray. 
In spite of all Henley's statements to police, he said he was innocent, and the trial began. Wait till the end Henley's of the mother trial. was there throughout the trial to give her son support. There has been the justice. parents of victims okay. were there looking for justice. In the end, the jury convicted Henley and sentenced him to six consecutive terms of 99 years each. Those who participated in the trial and those who watched had heard a horror story like no other. Now it appears the story will have to be told again. Henley pretty much was of the perspective that he was forced to do this. Yeah. If he hadn't have done this, you know, Coral would have killed him and his family. So he had no choice but to cooperate. And therefore, in his mind and in his view, he kind of thought himself as a hero because he put a stop to this. The mental gymnastics it would take to get yourself well, to, Brooks to, from, from there to there, I mean. Right. Brooks did not help him. Brooks claimed that Henley enthusiastically engaged in the tortures and murders, and it was, he showed a pretty wide sadistic streak. Okay. And I think it was later discovered at the trial that Henley participated in at least a half a dozen yeah. of the murders and torture as well. The, the impact that this continues to have. On, on the Houston area. I mean, how many families, well, I'll ask this, how many families are still... We actually uh, formed a Facebook group mm -hmm. that we have where we, we're connected with the families. It's a private group where we keep everybody abreast as to what's happening okay. in this case. So you have still to this day, obviously there's only, to my knowledge, only one parents that are still alive. And that was his last known victim. That was 13 year old uh, uh, Stan Dramella. Right. And I deal with, with a lot, with, and I see their pain. I think people forget sometimes, and I'm talking, when I say people, I say that you talk about with this rebirth of true crime and, and everything. One thing that I, I, I always try and think about is it never ends for the families. You know, for those of us that cover it, for even the, you know, some of the prosecutors and the attorneys and all, you, it has the moment, it's, it's concluded, the trial people go to prison, but yeah. the families, it never, Well, a ever, great example is this case, Robert. I think most people in Houston know the name of Elmer Wayne Henley. They know the name of Dean Coral, and they know David Brooks. Mm -hmm. But I'll bet you if you went around anywhere, you can't name one of their victims. No. Yes. But we all know who they are. They're the, the household names. They're the ones who the infamy and immortality are given. They're the ones who the books are written about. They're the ones who the movies are made of. And they're the ones who end up on uh, true crime streaming shows. They're forever immortalized. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here today. And I really do appreciate the time and the insights. And thank you for joining us for this episode of The Evidence Room. We're gonna be back next week with another case. And that's going to be the case of Wanda Holloway, the woman convicted of trying to knock off one of her daughter's cheerleading rivals so her daughter could get on the cheerleading team. That's next week when The Evidence Room streams on Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. on KPRC 2+.